Welcome to Eye Contact, a video news program on issues and controversies in ophthalmology sponsored by Eurotimes. I'm Oliver Findel. We're here at the 32nd Congress of the ESCRS in London. End of the mitis, although fortunately rare, continues to be the most feared complication of cataract surgery. The ESCRS Anothmitis study, published in 2007, concluded that intracameral cefuroxim significantly reduced the incidence of endothomitis after cataract surgery. Now there are concerns about endothomitis following anti-VEGF injections for retinal disease. Today we're speaking with Dr. Peter Barry of Dublin, Ireland, director of the ESCRS endothomitis study, about endothomitis risks. Peter? Thank you for coming and joining us today. My pleasure. First, could you remind us of the principal findings of the ESCRS endothomitis study? Sure. It was actually the principal findings of the study were really announced the last time that we were here in London at the ESCRS meeting here in this very Excel conference centre back in 2006. And I think that the overwhelming finding of the study was that the utilisation of a single injection of kefiroxine, one milligram in 0.1 ml of normal saline, directly into the anterior chamber at the very end of the case, after the wound has been hydrated, dramatically reduced the endophthalmitis incidence. It's the only randomized study uh, in the world literature. Patients were randomly allocated into receiving intracameral kefiroxine or not. And there was a five-fold reduction in the occurrence of infective endophthalmitis in the group who were randomly allocated to receive that injection as opposed to the group that weren't. There were other variables, you know, whether the use of topical antibiotics intensively at the time of the surgery as opposed to uh, placebo drops, but these were not shown to exert a meaningful difference. The overwhelming risk factor uh, was the uh, failure to inject kefiroxine. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, that's what we found. And, you know, the, since then, it's really been quite well taken up. You know, in, the, in, 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 in advances in medicine, eight years isn't a particularly long time. Um, we have done surveys of our own ESCRS members and mm -hmm. clinics around Europe. And we estimate that now in Europe, the utilization of intracameral kefiroxine is about 75% of all cataract surgeries, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is a lot. It varies from country to country. It's about 100% in my country. It's perhaps lowest in Germany, uh, if you look at Europe. But since the study published those results, countries have adopted it. Mm -hmm. Countries have published their outcomes. And every country that you look at, every report that's there shows a meaningful reduction in endophthalmitis where the intracameral injection is utilized. If the rate was high, it got very low. Mm -hmm. If their rate prior to adopting this technique was low, it got even lower. Mm -hmm. The point being that everywhere it was done, studies from France, from South Africa, from North America, from Spain, mm -hmm. from China, have shown a meaningful reduction by utilizing uh, the intracameral antibiotic. I mean, for those who are not using the intracameral antibiotic at the moment, what do they actually do? Do you have any idea from the surveys? I think that those who are not using intracameral, some are using antibiotics in the infusion, mm -hmm. which we don't think is a good idea. Some just rely on uh, intensive topical antibiotic drops, mm -hmm. either before and after the surgery or mm -hmm. just after the surgery. And the other thing that goes without saying is adequate uh, preoperative antisepsis with povidone iodine, which is the commonest used in Europe, chlorhexidine they use in Scandinavia. Uh, but that's taken as a given. Yeah. Um, the role of antibiotic drops is much more questionable, but mm -hmm. antisepsis is mandatory. Intracameral kefiroxine, we would consider, uh, is mandatory, mm -hmm. uh, with few exceptions. Mm -hmm. To those that aren't using it, I think that the evidence is that even if they're convinced that they don't have a need because their rates are low, mm -hmm. the holy grail is zero endophthalmitis. You just said that uh, antibiotics in the infusion bottle is probably not helpful or not as helpful. Why? 
Well, I think that it's not very scientific because the amount of antibiotic that's utilized mm -hmm. in any particular case is going to vary enormously depending on how much of the infusion fluid is used. And secondly, uh, the staff, yourself, the surgeon, the operating theater, the whole suite is going to become contaminated by the antibiotic being in contact. And I think that will just encourage uh, resistance. Mm -hmm. I think the minimal way to get antibiotic resistance is by a single bolus mm -hmm. injection to the, to the patient at the end of the case. So Peter, one uh, common criticism of uh, the ESCRS protocol was that uh, the difficulty in actually uh, preparing the intracameral cefiroxin. Uh, what are your comments on that? Yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a fair point. I think that the irony of the study is that it actually showed the efficacy and the safety of a drug that didn't exist. It's the only clinical trial in medicine that ever, ever did that. Yes, kefiroxine at the time of the study and until recently was not available in an FDA or EMA, European Medicines Agency, format as a single sterile unit dose for intraocular surgery. And therefore, the surgeons had to make it up themselves, so-called kitchen pharmacy. And I think that kitchen pharmacy undoubtedly runs the risk of errors of dilution, uh, errors of diluent, and there certainly are reports in the literature of catastrophic outcomes mm -hmm. from uh, errors in uh, dilution mm -hmm. and of uh, contamination where in some centers they use the same vial for multi-dosing. Mm -hmm. So I think that we certainly, now there is an approved product. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no financial interest, but there is a European medicines approved product by the Thea company in France, which is now registered in 17 European countries. Mm -hmm. So that, that particular risk uh, is now gone. Mm -hmm. But you're right to mention it. I mean, one other point of why some surgeons were reluctant to um, go to intracameral cefiroxim is this idea or question of allergy, especially in patients who have a penicillin. Oh, history of penicillin allergy, yeah. This question comes up all the time. What do you do with a patient who has a history of penicillin allergy? And the catch-22 is that we all know that true penicillin allergy is much less common than, rep than the patient's report. Um, and there's also a myth that there's cross-reactivity between the cephalosporins and penicillin, mm -hmm. so that if a person has a history or an anxiety about penicillin allergy, that they will be allergic to the kefiroxine. Mm -hmm. And in fairness to that criticism, we have to accept that there are two reported cases in the literature of anaphylaxis attributable to intracameral kefiroxine occurring at the end of cataract surgery. Both patients survived, but nonetheless, these incidents are reported. But the risk is incredibly small because nowadays it's recognized that you can divide your cephalosporins into different groups depending on the molecular structure of the side chain. Mm -hmm. And some, for example, cefazoline shares the molecular side chain structure of penicillin and thus carries a risk of cross allergy. But kefiroxine and keftazidine do not share that molecular side chain, and thus uh, the risk is virtually non-existent. So the question to ask your patient is not, is, he, is there a history of allergy to penicillin, but is there a history of allergy to cephalosporins? Okay. Uh, last question is now anti-VEGFs. They're being used more and more readily uh, for retinal disease. Yes. Um, and obviously endothematis uh, is also happening in that setting. Um, what do we know and where do we go? What do we know and where do we go? I think, first of all, we know very little. I think we know that the use of prophylactic antibiotics following into anti-VEGF intravitreal injections is very likely counterproductive, simply because you may simply be eradicating some bacteria and allowing bacterial resistance to develop in the frail elderly patient Mm. who's on antibiotic drops for a couple of weeks following their anti-VEGF injection and then is exposed to their next anti-VEGF injection two weeks later and you have perhaps harvested the very organisms which are resistant to the antibiotic that you use as you will likely use the same one again the next time around. So they're probably counterproductive. In terms of frequency, the rates reported in the literature are all over the place mm -hmm. in terms of how frequent this is. 
The one that I rely on most is the Swedish Macular Registry because they published a report of 170 odd thousand consecutive intravitreal injections in a, a three year period up to the end of 2012 when it's published last year. And although the incidence of endophthalmitis per injection mm -hmm. is extremely low, because those patients are receiving 8, 10, 15 injections into that same eye over an extended period of time, the risk probably is as high as 1 in 500 patients. Not 1 in 500 injections, but 1 in 500 patients. So at that level, yes, it's an extremely serious issue and becoming an ever more important issue. The only answer that I could give at the moment is that certainly the same antisepsis regime of, of povidone iodine should be used with exposure for the full three minutes. That's a mm -hmm. mandatory requirement number one. We see no point in prophylactic antibiotic drops before or after uh, the anti-VEGF injection. But what we're doing, ESCRS, in combination with EU retina, mm -hmm. is establishing an endophthalmitis register on the lines of the Swedish endophthalmitis register so that if you, following either a cataract operation or an intravitreal injection, have a suspected case of clinical of endophthalmitis, you simply send that online into the registry. You think you might have a case. That's all you've got to do. Mm -hmm. And 90 days later, you will receive a computer-generated question asking you for that particular patient, was the endophthalmitis diagnosis correct, yes or no? If the answer was no, that's the end of it. If the answer was yes, then there are a series of subsequent questions identifying what, if any, antibiotics were used, what was mm -hmm. the antiseptic prophylactic agent used, what was the exposure time of that, what was the organisms that you cultured if you had a culture-positive case of endophthalmitis, and was vitrectomy performed as part of the treatment? And what was the ultimate visual outcome? Whether it's following cataract surgery or following antivegetative injections, uh, the fundamental questions uh, are the same. For cataract surgery, it asks whether you had an intracameral injection of kefuroxine or another alternative intracameral antibiotic. But the information that we'll gain, we won't gain knowledge on incidence. We won't know how many injections these few cases represent but it would function rather like the, you know, the trust system in the United States tracking bacterial resistance in the US today, TRUST, the trust system. It would be like that in the sense that it will give us information on the organisms. Mm -hmm. It will give us information on changing sensitivities and resistance to topical antibiotics. Uh, in that sense, it will be uh, uh, very useful information, and it's pan-European because each individual clinic, fortunately, has uh, uh, fairly few cases. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for being with us today. And thank you for joining us. And if you want any more information on this topic or related topics, please visit us under eurotimes.org.